around 20 years ago, I began my career as a junior sysadmin here in New South Wales. And I learned about Usenix conferences from Sysadmin magazine. There was an advertisement, and I really wanted to go and learn from the experts. But Usenix conferences were so far away in the States. Years later, I moved to the States, and I started going to Usenix conferences in 2010. And since then, they've been really great for my own career and also my employer. And I hope the same is the case for you. It is my ridiculous pleasure to be bringing the first keynote for a Usenix conference here in Sydney. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay my respect to elders past and present. This talk came from when I did the update to Systems Performance Second Edition and thought, wow, this would make a really great talk. However, at the time, I was working for Netflix, and the talk does not, is not an official Netflix talk. It is a talk by Brennan Gregg writing Systems Performance. I've since changed to Intel, and it's the same case. This is not an official Intel talk either. I'm going to cover eight topics. And the takeaways, the main one is a tour of what's going on in computing performance, the current and future technologies. Hopefully, this will help you design faster systems to meet performance needs in SLOs, and to help you identify new technologies that you need to support and maintain. The first topic is processors. If you remember in the 90s, clock speed kept going up. You could do performance engineering by doing nothing at all, just waiting for the next Intel CPU. It was amazing. When will it end? Well, we have 100 gigahertz processors. Well, we know how it ends. And I have an example here. I'm using CPUs from the AWS EC2 cloud as an example. Of course, I was at Netflix for over eight years, so that was what I studied a lot. And you can see we leveled off to around 3.5 gigahertz. There is a new CPU. I don't have the SKU number and the exact model name that is now in beta at Amazon. That's the Sapphire Rapids from Intel. That's finally gone up to 3.9 gigahertz, but you can still see there's not been the same exponential growth that we saw in the 90s. And the reason is power and efficiency. Clock speed has hit a sweet spot. There are some CPUs that are faster, so we know in workstations you can get into the 5 gigahertz range. Instead of moving up with clock speed, we're scaling horizontally instead. So more CPU cores, hardware threads, and server instances. And you can see the red line shows the hardware threads, and that's going up. Interconnects are really important. They are scaling as well, not quite as much as the core count, but things are catching up. I have often seen workloads that are blocked on the CPU inter interconnects or the memory buses. It's actually really confusing because this presents itself to you as CPU utilization. And the CPUs are not making forward progress. They're waiting for stall cycles on the memory bus or on interconnects. And so when you see CPU utilization is the blocking factor, you may think, let's go to faster CPUs. But that just costs more money and it doesn't solve the problem, and it's because of the interconnects. And I've got a diagram there. I've been talking about this for a while. CPU utilization is wrong or deeply misleading because it gives you the wrong idea. So we do need the interconnects to get faster. We need the memory buses to get faster and memory to get faster as well. Lithography. So this is how small you can print details on the silicon wafers. That's been moving down three nanometers, two nanometers. Where will this end? The, I had to look it up. The diameter of a silicon atom is 0 0.2 nanometers. And IBM has already built a two nanometer fab. So you have to think, are we going to get to the point where logic gates are a single atom across? What's the reliability of this? Like, couldn't a cosmic ray go and wipe out some of my circuitry? It's really mind-boggling. And if, it, if we start going beneath the 0 0.2 nanometer range, that's when you wake up and realize you're in the matrix and it's all a simulation. It's all lies. <laughs> Fortunately, there's a, another explanation and that it's already been lies since 2010. So it's 
now in marketing terms, so they haven't really gone below 10 or 12 nanometers. IBM's two nanometer fab actually has a 12 nanometer gate length. And so what they've done is they're using all sorts of other ways to improve the performance of silicon chips. But you may stay on the 12 nanometer process. And so the marketing groups have thought, well, we want to call it something better. So let's keep calling it 9 and 7 and 5 and 3. So it's a marketing term. Intel and other companies have proposed coming up with better terms for that. So for gate pitch, metal pitch, and tiers, GMT or LMC, it has not yet caught on. I've got some other notes. So throughout my talk, I do have all these footnotes. The slides are online. My footnotes include the lithography limits. We do expect to reach them by 2029, so switching to stack CPU. So we aren't far away from the predicted limits there. And there's also other really exciting things happening with fabs. Intel's building a fab in Ohio, $20 billion fab that's expected to be a mega city. So the US can print it on its own chips. So is TSMC. So there's a lot happening in this space. So other processor scaling techniques beyond lithography, special instructions. Intel and other manufacturers have done this for a while. So AVX 512, VNNI instructions. Connected chiplets. In the footnotes, I've got a couple of examples. So Intel Sapphire Rapids that's being released now has four tiles on the processor die that are connected with a high-speed bridge. AMD's Milan X has nine chiplets. 3D stacking is where you print multiple layers of silicon. And Intel does that with HBM memory, which I'll get to later. And AMD does that with Vcash. And it's really technically challenging. I've read white papers about how if there is a defect when you're printing another layer, when you keep putting other layers on, it's like a pea under a stack of mattresses. It deflects and warps the upper layers. And so they have ways of drilling around it and deactivating the warped circuitry. It's amazing stuff. And then hybrid core architecture, another way to scale. That's ARM um, has got big little. Intel's now doing P cores and E cores. To put up some recent processor examples, this is especially helpful if you're still on older processors. So you can see what's, what's new. We've got AMD Epic, 96 cores, ARM-based Ampera Ultra Max, 128 cores. The Intel Ice Lake is looking a bit sad at the moment with 40 cores. And it's well known that Intel has had delays with the next generation Intel CPUs, which are highly anticipated. That's Sapphire Rapids. So anticipated, when I was researching this, I saw an article, a smuggler hit over 200 older Lake CPUs in a fake silicon belly. And the first thing I thought is like, wait a minute, 200 CPUs in your belly? That's not CPUs. That's a supercomputer. That's a wearable supercomputer. So coming soon to a data center near you, hopefully, although there has been a, a widely known TSMC chip shortage that's been hurting the auto industry. Apart from the traditional processor vendors, there's many more that are ARM licensed or RISC-V. Amazon has made great work with the Graviton CPUs. They're now up to Graviton 3. At reInvent, they just announced Graviton 3E, customized for HPC. Microsoft have been doing things with ARM, and they've now got Ampera Ultra instances on their cloud. And Google's been doing chips for a while. So I'd expect at some point, I would totally guess there might be something. Google, of course, does phones, chips for phones, systems on chips. Accelerators is another huge topic that's different nowadays. Apart from GPUs for doing parallel workloads and doing AI and machine learning, there's FPGAs appearing in lots of places, including on NICs for reprogrammable semiconductors. They are quite complicated to program. But there's also IPUs, DPUs, TPUs, and so on. When I was interviewing with Intel, they wanted me to work on all of these acronyms, and I had to look up some of them. I don't quite know, know what all of these things are. IPUs are infrastructure processing units. We've got data processing units, TensorFlow processing units, and so on. Google has the TPU cores. AWS has its Trainium, machine learning, and AI accelerators. Think about these as these have bigger performance potential. They are more difficult to use. 
But you also have to mentally think about their existence as new things to monitor and maintain and be aware of as SREs. Just to show you some latest GPU examples, NVIDIA GeForce, 10,000 CUDA cores, and Cerebras, which at the time was the largest computer on a single chip. They just used the whole wafer for one chip. So almost a million AI optimized cores. They recently, they're now clustering them. So they can have multiple millions of cores in a Cerebras wafer scale cluster. They're doing that for the Andromeda supercomputer. Some of the latest FPGA examples, the Xilinx Ultra Scale was getting up to 9 million logic cells. And I had this example because you could deploy it on AWS EC2, the F1 instance, so you can get your hands dirty on FPGAs very easily. Haven't seen a new update for a while, but then Xilinx has been busy because they've recently been acquired by AMD. BPF, I'll talk about that later. There's already ways to run BPF on FPGAs. So that's just a very quick tour of the processor space. To help reinforce learning, I'll now talk about what my predictions are as someone who works in this industry, works on performance teams, and in a way it shows of all the complex information, like a pile of Lego, how can someone build it and construct something from it? My predictions may not be right, but it helps you see how I can make sense of it. So the first thing is multi-socket. With everything that's going on, I think multi-socket is doomed. Multi-socket is a very complicated technology, and we're grateful for the engineers who made it happen and, and solve all sorts of issues. And it served its need at a particular point in time to scale from two cores to four cores to eight cores to 16 cores. But now the processors themselves are getting so big, you can get to 100 cores over 100 cores just on a single processor. So why do I need multi-socket now, bearing in mind that multi-socket you do pay NUMA costs, as I have to talk of that interconnect, and interconnects can, can be issues, especially when you're doing remote memory and, and you're doing memory over the interconnect. Also bear in mind cloud computing and the adoption of cloud computing, not just public clouds, but also private clouds people are running internally and I've drawn my hierarchy, so if, it's, if, you, if your workload is less than 200 cores, you could run that on a single socket. If it's more than 200 cores, well, you could run that on the cloud. So I just don't really see a big need for multi-socket systems anymore. Some people will try and argue with me that there's rack and chassis overheads and costs, so, so it can be financially beneficial, but then there's ways to do multiple sleds in a one rack unit of single socket machines, which people are doing. I was talking to Liz Fung Jones earlier, and she made an interesting observation in that the CPU interconnect isn't dead, but it's now the high speed network on the cloud. So I'm connecting multiple cloud instances as single sockets together using the network interconnect. This blows my mind. But it's true, that's, that's what is happening. And of course, there's other reasons why it's beneficial to be on a, a cloud type environment, and that's reliability. So, even if you said, here is a 10,000 socket processor you can run your entire environment on, well, how does failover look, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are benefits. I think the multi-socket future is cloud-based, but it's also mixed. We'll have sockets for cores, GPUs, FPGAs, machine learning, and so on. Another personal prediction, the future of Simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threads, I think, is also unclear. This is another technology that served a great role, but now things have changed, and far too much I see people comparing, say, a eight-core AMD system or ARM system versus a four-core Intel system that has eight hardware threads. So eight virtual CPUs versus eight actual cores. And the hardware threads, the virtual CPUs, we know they're not quite as fast as full cores, and so that puts the Intel options at a disadvantage. I think if the whole way they're sold and marketed and packaged is changed, might provide a future for them. If they're thought of as like AVX 512 or another extension, 
you could get to the point where you're saying, let's compare an 8-core Intel versus an 8-core AMD or ARM. And the 8-core Intel has the thing you can turn on that gives you extra virtual CPUs if you want it. Some people turn it off anyway. So that'll be interesting to see what happens. Core count limits. Imagine an 850,000 core server processor with the Linux kernel and the Java runtime trying to scale. I worked at some microsystems, and each time we, we went up with the number of CPUs, there are unimaginable number of things we had to fix in the kernel and the memory subsystems and so on and so on and so on. There are worsening problems. Memory-bound workloads, lock contention, false sharing, power consumption, and so on. I think general purpose computing will hit a practical core limit. And I would say that's going to be around 1,000 cores, which is already called kilocore, core, kilo core scale. And once, you, once you're at 1,000 cores, have multiple instances on the cloud. So you get that failover capability. Some applications themselves already have inbuilt limits. So Node.js doesn't really work well on more than two CPUs because of the way it has the vent worker thread and the IO threads. P cores and E cores. Intel Alder Lake has this. Will it come to Sapphire Rapids or a later Intel server CPU? I think it's really interesting. My prediction is it will because I see so many use cases. Imagine on the server moving your garbage collection threads, your NUMA rebalancing background, like background kernel tasks, background application tasks, being able to move them to the E cores so they don't interfere with performance on the P cores, the performance cores. It's much, it's easier said than done. And none of these slides, by the way, to, to reiterate, are an announcement from Intel. And most of these slides I created while I was still at Netflix. So it's easier said than done. Some of the challenges include that software is compiled and will use, say, AVX 512 extensions. They're currently only on the P cores. So if you've got a thread that's running and it's doing AVX 512, can the OS kernel scheduler then move it over to the E cores? well, then it suddenly finds the instructions don't work that it's using. So early on, there were configurations where people were disabling the AVX 512 instructions just so the threads could move between the P cores and E cores, which is a little bit crazy because I've seen die photos of these modern CPUs where AVX 512 is as much as 10% of the core footprint. So this is you're like you're turning off 10% of the silicon <laughs> So we really want to make use of all of the silicon that's printed, so absolutely figure this stuff out. I'd say there's three areas of processor scaling. Clock frequency, it's already reached its sweet spot for servers around 3.5 gigahertz, although we did see 3.9. Core and thread count, I'd predict it's going to hit 1,000. But there's just so many false sharing and lock contention and et cetera issues. And then cache size and policy, I think we'll get to a limit there as well. And then we need to think about new things, which would be exciting. So an entirely new computer hardware architecture, kernel memory architecture, or logic gate technology. There's going to be more processor vendors, ARM licensed or RISC-V. And it's the era of CPU choice. Beware, however, of optimizing for the benchmark. I had an interesting example I gave during, when I was a Netflix employee, I gave it during the Intel innovation event last year, where a non-Intel machine benchmarked, a CPU benchmark, it was 2.6 times faster than the Intel machines for CPU. 2.6 times faster. That's it, moved the whole cloud over. In production, it was not faster. And I did the cycle level analysis using Intel PEBS and found that the CPU benchmark was div instruction bound. So it's basically only testing the div instruction. I feel like an idiot because I'd been looking at the code, and the code was a prime number generator. <laughs> and like, what does prime number generation do? Factorials. Of course it's going to be div instruction bound. I should have seen it sooner. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I confirmed it's div instruction bound. And then there's ways you can measure div instruction usage on the cloud. So I did that at Netflix and found that it was less than 1% of all cycles were in the div instruction. That explained why the 2.6x uh, benchmark win was not visible in production. But yeah, really fast div instruction made that CPU look great in the benchmarks. I'd beware of this happening in the future. You've always got to do production tests. 
you know, the best way to evaluate these things is in production after you've tuned both sides and made sure they're running the fast they can. Since there's so many new processor vendors, Intel is making changes to compete. And Pat Gelsinger is back as, CP, as CEO, and a lot of people are excited about that. And I guess I'm excited because I did join. My prediction, cloud CPU advantage. I think people like Amazon have a huge advantage right now because they have over 100,000 workloads they can analyze directly and use that information to influence Graviton design. And I've got an example here of PerfScript. I don't know if you've used Intel Processor Trace, but when I was a Netflix employee, Intel kept telling me to try it out. And it's like, but it's like, what it does is it gives you a trace of every instruction with details of every instruction that you run. It's like, what am I supposed to do with like terabytes of information per second? But if you are designing CPUs and you capture this, you, you have the ability to capture this information from a wide number of customers, you can imagine you can design better CPUs if you can sift through all that data, which is why I think machine-aided aided processor design is also going to be a big thing. For companies like Intel to compete, I think Intel need, needs to have its own cloud to get more experience with the clouds. This is my prediction before joining Intel. And now there is the Intel Developer Cloud that has been launched. So you can get early access to things like Sapphire Rapids. FPGA, I think it needs a turning point. I've been banging on this with, the, with various people for years to get this done, where with FPGAs, the current strategy is, hey, you should learn how to do it. You might need a PhD or two, but like, go for it. Um, figure out how to code them. It's like, no, no, developers, we just want to be able to like, let the JVM figure it out. Because the JVM and other runtimes, they can use, they can do different compilations of methods, have them run in parallel, see what works. Use, use an FPGA as a, as a method compilation target, and then try its performance. And so my faked up future is you apt install openjdk-21 libfpga, you run Java with a use FPGA option, and it's done. It's like, if that happens, then we'll see much bigger adoption, and then it's up to the JVM to figure out what to run on the FPGA. Memory. So I mentioned this already briefly. So many workloads are IO, memory I.O. bound. Here's one of my CLI tools, PMC Arch, for the architectural PMC, PMCs are performance monitoring counters on the CPU from the performance monitoring unit, PMU. They're also known under, by like six other names, but I won't go through them all. I just stick to one, PMCs. I've highlighted a column. This is from three different Netflix microservices. The IPC instructions per cycle, I generally like to see that get to 1.5. So for every CPU cycle, we can retire on average one and a half instructions. Why is it more than one? It's because the CPU can do things in parallel. It's got multiple units in the back end. And so in theory, depending on how wide the instruction fetch decode path is, you can get up to four, an IPC of 4.0 for a completely synthetic micro benchmark. And newer CPUs are going up to eight, an eight wide processor. But practically, for a practical workload, I'll see IPC get to 1.5, and that's about it. This is like an efficiency metric of miles per gallon of how well the, the underlying architecture works. I still can't get my head around, what is it, 100 liters per kilometer or one liter per 100 kilometers since moving back to Australia. So it's like miles per gallon. These are all terrible, like 0.11 for a microservice. They could go 10 times faster if we find out the low level architectural issue, which I already know, it's memory. And I can see my last level cache hit ratio is, is bad. It's only 77%. I like that to be 99%. So we need faster memory. DDR5 has better bandwidth, has a faster bus, there are DIMMs, and it's now arriving in clouds. It does need processor support. So Sapphire Rapid supports it, AWS Graviton 2 supports it, and Graviton 3 supports it. It increases the gigabytes per second bandwidth, and you can also increase the capacity. Interestingly, d when I was first coming up with these slides, I uh, noticed that AP, the APC had already covered the Australian Personal Computer Magazine because desktop gamers are really into the very latest hardware. And as a server engineer, it's, it was interesting to pick up a desktop magazine and learn from it. So 
kudos to that, their coverage. Well, that's great, DDR5, let's use DDR5 everywhere. Unfortunately, while it increases bandwidth, it does not increase latency. And the latency hasn't really changed in 20 years. The reason is, similar to the CPU clock rate, there is a sweet spot with the internal clock rate of how DDR works. It's this 200 megahertz clock that it's built around. In my footnotes, I've got references. There's papers. You can read all about it. It's fascinating. But they believe that's it. That's their sweet spot. And so they're going to keep the latency like that for the foreseeable future, which is why it hasn't changed. There has been different types of memory. So there's RLD RAM for reduced latency DRAM. But it's just not seen much widespread usage outside of high frequency traders. But there's different types of memory. HBM, high bandwidth memory. It's been used in GPUs for a while. I have heard there's been some reliability issues with HBM as well. So that's another interesting dimension to keep out. Keep an eye on for new memory technologies is, uh, yes, they work and they're fast, but also what's their failure rates? High bandwidth memory it uses 3D stacking. Processors can now include it on package. So Intel Sapphire Rapids, this is all very recent things that have been made public recently. And some of these aren't quite public. They're rumored. And I've got a diagram here. Processor package, cores, HBM, that's it. No DRAM. No DRAM systems are now possible. So Intel's got three modes for HBM. So you can run it in HBM only mode, which is great. What about other processor vendors? So AMD has vCache, which is another on-processor large amount of memory. I haven't seen it yet, but it would surprise me not if they came up with a new mode to run vCache as a memory mode, so that they had their, their answer to those three types of memory modes. I'm not pre-announcing anything from, from AMD, but that, that would be my guess. They, they'll come up with something similar. Server DRAM size is huge. Here, for my examples, I'm actually picking on single socket configurations because of the, of the earlier slide where I said single socket is dead. But I can't find a new single socket example that's DDR5, so the new DDR5 things from Supermicro and multi-socket. They need to update it. I've got DDR5 and I want single socket. Sell me a, sell me a system board. And I've got an example from Facebook's Open Compute Project for Delta Lake, which is another one socket configuration, 96 gigabytes of DDR4. Four terabytes of DDR4 is pretty impressive. When I first came up with these slides, I had a, I explained persistent memory, which was Intel and Micron's 3D cross point. Since then, that's now been canceled. And I'll get to why soon, but it's, one reason is, I'm sort of leading you there. If I can have four terabytes of main memory, what applications have a working set size bigger than four terabytes? One of the, one of the modes of persistent memory was to increase the caching footprint of the, the working set size. But like we're already at terabytes of main memory. So do we really need that extra layer? So my predictions in, this, in the memory space, not a JDIC announcement, but you can pretty much see how DDR is going to keep increasing in bandwidth. But we may not see a drop in single access latency. DDR5, I do think you'll see up to 2x wins if you do happen to be memory bandwidth bound. I've got a diagram here of IPC. I did mention earlier IPC 1.5, I think is good. You need PMCs to measure it, which is starting to become available in the cloud. And if you have a low IPC, that's when you're more likely to see wins from improvements to the memory subsystem. HBM only servers, well, now it's public that there is a mode to do it. And I would expect to see that being offered in the cloud as well. And maybe one day we'll get RL DRAM on the cloud so more people can play with it outside of New York. I had this when I first did this talk. I thought the extra tier of persistent memory was too late. And that has now been, because it's instead of being a pyramid, it's more like a trapezoid because there's so much main memory. Uh, and that's now the case. Disks. Lots of things happening in disks. Lots of things happening in everywhere in like all of these topics. So this is a great a grand tour. 
We've got perpendicular magnetic recording to shape the magnetic field so that it can be smaller when you record things, shingle magnetic recording and so on. Those in green, I would expect would improve performance. SMR does not. I haven't played with the later two yet. The later two include doing things like using lasers to heat up a spot on the platter so that the magnetic field can write an even smaller area. Shingle magnetic recording is where it writes like shingles on a roof. So the read head is smaller than the write head. The problem is you will overwrite other tracks whenever you write data, so you have to read them and rewrite them elsewhere, and so it, it can really kill performance. And so SMI is for archival only. Flash memory, there's many different types there as well, from single level cell onwards, 3D NAND, vertical NAND, and there was Intel Optane, 3D crosspoint persistent memory disks that are now canceled. They began to use that as an accelerator. SSDs have performance pathologies, so latency from aging, wear leveling, fragmentation, internal compression. Inside the SSD, it has its own computer with its own file system and its own routines, which we don't have much visibility of, except for extrapolation from latency. As this technology gets more complicated and they need to do more wear leveling, I think we'll see more pathologies. Storage interconnects. Things are getting faster, so when you're designing systems, you need to be aware that SAS4 cards are in development, PCIe 5 is coming soon, NVMe 1.4 is the latest. When looking and evaluating at, at these different options, note that they also have features other than speed. So reliability, power management, virtualization support, temperature things, sensors, all sorts of stuff, other than just those speed numbers. I've got a slide just to give you an idea of the latest storage device example. So here's a Samsung SSD, up to 15 terabytes on an SSD, PCIe Gen 5, Sequential reads up to 13 gigabytes a second. And as an example for Seagate, the Exos 2X18, 18 or 16 terabytes, helium sealed as it improves things. It is multi-actuator, so it has two sets of heads that can move independently to improve random I.O. performance. They say up to 2X more performance. Uh, up to 500 megabytes per second, which I noticed they call SSD performance. Not quite that SSD performance. The other interesting detail is 7200 RPM. So I, I feel that they're hitting their sweet spot as well for archival, because you remember we, we were at, what, 15K RPM disks? So they're slowing down. 18 or 16 terabytes. The spec sheet did not say whether this was, usually when you see that, the larger one is shingle magnetic recording and the smaller one is conventional magnetic recording. But the spec sheet did not explain it to me. So I actually don't know. But I would guess that 18 was SMR but that's not official. <laughs> Apart from hardware, there's also software, and there has been interesting things happening in Linux, so Linux Kyber IO Scheduler, Multi-Queue, Target Read and Write Latency at Netflix, we were switching to using this, as it improved the up to 300x lower 99th percentile latencies. And it had multiple queues for reads and writes, and would dynamically adjust the queue size. So my predictions, rotational disks are becoming specialized for archival, and they're still great for density. They're going to become bigger, slower, and weirder. My prediction with flash memory, they're becoming bigger and faster, but I think they're going to, we will see more flash pathologies, more wear leveling and logic, more latency outliers. And so I really think we need more observability of flash drive internals. Networking. Latest hardware includes 400 gigabit and 800 gigabit networks. And more NIC features. Inline KTLS, so, so TLS for security offloaded to the NIC, such as Mellanox's ConnectX, and Netflix wrote an article about that. FPGAs and P4 and eBPF support are available on NICs as well, so that you can offload far more logic and do things like DDoS attack mitigation down at the NIC level, do programmatic switch fabrics, and all sorts of things. Protocols, Quick and HTTP3 for TCP-like sessions over UDP, 
and faster handshakes and multipath TCP, which is being adopted now to improve parallel throughput and stability. There are newer TCP congestion control algorithms, DCTCP by Daniel Berkman, Data Center TCP, TCP New Vegas, TCP BBR, which at Netflix we switched to using, so bottleneck bandwidth and RTT to improve performance. I've got a diagram here of the network stack from Systems Performance Second Edition. Just so you can get your head around it, there are multiple places for queues. So we've got the socket, buffers, queue disks, queuing disciplines, that's selectable algorithms. You can pick different queue disks. Google does lots of this queue disk work. So you can pick different queue disks to suit different workloads. And then you've got queues down on the devices. And the SEM path is getting more complicated. This is what the SEM path looks like from the socket to metal now. All of these different things on Linux to improve performance. Global send offload and TCP short queues and Nagel congestion controls, byte queue limits. <laughs> when I see diagrams like this, it's like I want a performance tool to show me how each of these things are working. Yes, I know the engineers have created byte queue limits, but does it work? Like, can I see metrics? What's its error rate? Sometimes you find out like the engineer has created a thing, but it's not, it's never been working ever. No one's had a way to measure it. So when I, when I see diagrams like this, it's like, ah, oh, how do I measure every single component? Software, the express data path in software, XTP, uses eBPF. That's seeing greater adoption as it provides a fast lane throughout the kernel. It's like kernel bypass, but something that is directly supported inside the kernel, Linux kernel, and is programmatic. A role previously served by DBDK. My predictions in this space. I think BPF, we'll see that in FPGAs and IPUs, infrastructure processing units, because they have massive transceiver capabilities for throughput. And Netronome already did that. And it will be a thing to see edge computing on the NICs. So we can do very light workloads like proxies and caches, and then push that down to the NIC. Good luck with observability, because now you've moved it out of your observability system. So you've, you solve one problem, and you create like three more. Cheap BPF routers, the whole use case of, of BPF, when extended BPF, which I'll get to later, was to take commodity hardware and then make programmatic routers and smart fabrics out of them. And I think there's more demand for network performance in general. Apps increasingly network. We have a world of sensors, remote work and video conferencing, Netflix 4K content, VR tourism, and the multiverse if it takes off. What's happening in kernels? Some latest kernel releases. Linux just released 6.0, where the actual official name is Herder I'm a Ninja Sloth. FreeBSD is at 13.1. Some recent Linux performance features, just an example. Oh, we've now got IPv6 jumbograms, packets bigger than 64 kilobytes. But what will surprise no one in the room, the documentation says, this probably doesn't work on the internet. So this is for internal use within your data center only. Of course, BPF kernel function calls for congestion control algorithms. I've highlighted some of the more exciting ones, like IOU ring, I'll get to in a sec. So IOU ring, this is where we have a, we've been using syscalls, they've become a bit of a bottleneck forever, but we can have ring buffers between user space and the kernel, where you batch a bunch of syscalls, and then the kernel will read that ring buffer and dispatch them. And so this should be adopted by each of the runtimes, like Java and databases. And a lot of things should end up with IOU ring support for, for some substantial performance improvements. eBPF, big te technology, it's showing up everywhere. I've been working with Microsoft on getting it into Windows. It's, it originated from Linux. I haven't said the acronym yet because the co-creator, Alexis Storytoyov, says BPF is now a technology name. It is not an acronym. So eBPF. And it's because the origins of BPF are Berkeley Packet Filter. And that's hugely confusing. Because nowadays, eBPF has little to do with Berkeley or packets or filtering. It can, it can do packet filtering, but it can do so much more. Also, Alexis said he wanted BPF to have a three-letter acronym. 
So he's often calling it BPF instead of eBPF. We started calling it eBPF when we did the extensions in 2014 and 2015. But now you'll see me just call it BPF. And Alexi said the reason is BPF is also a bytecode. So BPF is a kernel execution environment that runs a bytecode similar to, say, JavaScript in your browser. But this is user-defined programs that run in the kernel. BPF itself, Alexi wanted a three-character acronym, so it's like other instruction sets, like x86 and ARM. Kernel engineers, you use the term BPF. Companies call eBPF because it Google's a bit better. So in the future, we'll have BPF event-based applications. With BPF, since it's a bytecode, you can define programs in user space, and the kernel will run them. Stephen Rostet said BPF will replace Linux because it's really taking over the conferences. Emerging BPF use cases, observability agents, security detection, mitigation, TCP congestion control algorithms, and so on. There's been a, Orange did a BMC cache D accelerator for memcached D in BPF. And they got 3x better improvement. My prediction, future BPF uses file system buffering and read ahead policies. CPU scheduler policies, and lightweight I.O. bound applications. It's weird because when you start running programs in BPF, they, they don't appear in top. They don't appear in PS minus EF. And so we're also working on all the tooling so that you can monitor and see these programs that are running. You may think you're not using BPF, but if you run BPF tool prog show, you may find, oh, I'm actually already running 16 BPF programs in production that were installed by systemd and various other applications, you just weren't aware of it. So emerging space is how we observe and debug it. Another prediction in this space, PGO, auto PGO. It shows 10% wins, but it's hard to manage. And this is where you take a running kernel, you profile it, and then you recompile it based on the profile feedback. I just included it in this section because I think that we desperately want an easier way to do this, so you, you can just turn it on and the kernel recompiles some hot paths, so partial JIT support. Kernel emulation is often slow. My prediction that things like w, WSL1, and I've lost my slides, but I'm sure they'll be back in a second. About kernel, kernel emulation, WSL1, that technology used emulation for syscalls, and that provides overheads, but I think technologies that WSL2, so it can call kernel functions directly, are faster. Do we have slides rebooting? Yes? Coming? No, no, it's not a blackout. Could you just pull it out? So we're going to do some debugging of the presentation by plugging, pulling out, pulling it out, and turning it in. Just don't ask me to reboot the laptop. Is there a BPF program, a BPF program for this? I want observability of the error rates from the AV system. I will keep going because the slides are online, and there are just important points I need to make while they work on this. Operating system performance. So Linux, BSD, and Windows. What, what do I think about these and what they're doing? I'm worried about the future of Linux, because if you look at companies like Netflix, there are so many things happening in Linux and so many tunables and new technologies that we became overwhelmed. And, and we knew that we weren't quite on top of everything. And if you're smaller companies, I think the future is you are running Linux that you just haven't been able to tune heavily. There's just too many things. Even if you're a large company that has an operating systems team and a performance team, there's just so many things that need your attention now. It's, it, at Netflix, it was difficult because we, when I started, there was Intel on the cloud, Java, Node.js. The, the things I had to look at were small. And then after eight years, I saw the rise of all sorts of Linux features, Kubernetes, service meshes, new processors to evaluate. And so it's, it's complicated. I think we need to get better defaults that the large companies like the FANGs have figured out into default Linux distros. Cool. 
Yay, thank you. <laughs> Unikernels, another interesting topic. That's where you compile everything into one address space and run it like a program. I think they still need a compelling use case to convince people to try it out. It also cr creates, it's like solve one problem but create 10 more because now you have to redo observability. Hypervisors, another important topic, secret V2 rollout in Linux is happening. Containers, containers are becoming adopted everywhere, which is making life a bit harder for debugging things because you now have the issues of uh, noisy neighbors and being able to figure them out. And many performance tools are still not container aware. Hardware hypervisors, so Zen, KVM, and Nitro. I've got a few examples here. You can see over time, we've been moving things to have fewer circuitous paths to improve performance. So Nitro moves things into the bare metal, so we have near bare metal performance. And I had a blog post where I summarized this, and I showed how things are speeding up. So we're moving, where all of these different dimensions are becoming hardware virtualized. Lightweight VMs I'm really excited about. So AWS Firecracker, Intel and Microsoft and others are working on Cloud Hypervisor. That's where they're redoing a virtual machine from scratch. And you're getting container-like speeds, but you also get your own kernel for security and you can run all of the performance apps. So my prediction, containers, I've worked on this issue for a long time. Performance tools will still, still take several years to become fully container aware. And in the short term, I will see containers everywhere. But I think lightweight virtual machines is where we will want to move a lot of high performance workloads because you can do PGO kernels and there's no resource sharing, there's no sec comp overhead, overlay overhead, full perf tool access and so on. So I'd expect more adoption for high performance workloads. And it's an evolution, FAS, containers, lightweight VMs and then metal. For cloud computing, I think microservice consolidation will become a hot topic to lower communication costs because as you keep splitting things up, you have higher communication. And we'll see new technologies there. Observability. I've spoken about this a lot at Usenix. So in 2010, I talked about heat maps. In 2013, I talked about flame graphs. In 2016, I talked about eBPF. So now I think we have the age of seeing. Flame graphs are everywhere. They've been adopted by over 30 different companies. It's part of their products. There's over 80 implementations. Latency heat maps are widely available. eBPF and BPF trace for software observability. And I've been working on getting PMCs enabled in the cloud for hardware observability. There's an example of some of the BPF tools. I wrote a lot of these for doing low-level software observability in the kernel and applications. If you haven't seen BPF before, a lot of my tools are CLI based, so I can run exec snoop. There's processes that are running, and there's one liners, BPF trace, and I'm aggregating on the IO type, so it's doing frequency counts in the kernel for efficiency. The future is really libbpf tools because that's we're doing BPF in an ELF binary and it's portable. And so you end up with these tiny binaries that contain BPF programs. The modern open source observability stack is OpenTelemetry, Prometheus, and Grafana. And Grafana just released flame graphs. And there's a new concept, zero instrumentation APM. That's where you install your agent and that's it. It just dynamically instruments your software for you. You don't have to put OpenTelemetry into your code. It uses uprobes to instrument HTTP and SSL calls. My predictions in this space, BPF traces the, the tracer we've always wanted in Linux, and we'll be moving tools to libbpf tools. We will have too many BPF tools, and I'm partly to blame, because I've been publishing a lot. Although people won't really use my tools, they'll use GUIs. So over time, we'll see GUIs put on top of the tools, and especially at Netflix, people, you don't have time to SSH onto everything, you want to do it from self-service UIs. Zero instrumentation APM, I just mentioned. Multiple startups will start selling this, but someone will blog that open telemetry is more stable and faster. And they'll re reveal there is actually an issue where it's uprobes, which is the user space dynamic instrumentation, 
currently is slow on Linux. And we know we need to fix it. I've been talking about this at the Linux plumbers and, and other conferences. So we need to get uprobes fixed, I think, before this is truly viable. Flamescope is my next target I'd like people to adopt for flame graphs. That's where it does a sub-second offset heat map so it can analyze variance and perturbations and then generate a flame graph from particular ranges. So that's lots of topics. That's my recap so far. Performance engineering is getting more complex. It's also getting more fun if this happens to be your full-time job. But for a lot of us, it's not. And it's getting overwhelming. And you can lose track of things you need to adopt and tune. And that's why there's some new companies that are doing AI auto-tuning. They'll take all the things, measure it, give it to AI, and then do the server tuning directly. And so Intel acquired one called Granulate. There's another one called Akamas. What are the implications for SRE? I'm concerned about change control if I have AI changing the server. So there's ways to work around that so you can buffer the changes and then pull a lever to accept them. But I also think it's, we'll see a turning point. Someone will find a million dollar tunable that AI has discovered that they could have turned on 10 years ago. But as I mentioned earlier, the industry is getting so complex, we're losing, we're dropping the ball in various areas. And once someone blogs, here's the million dollar tunable, we would never have discovered it if we hadn't run some AI tuner. Then that will seriously get the ball rolling and make the case for the time is right for using AI to help us. That's my talk. Thank you very much. I've, the slides are online.